I've been using Nikon Z5 bodies over the last few months, taking them out to a little over 100 different real estate photography gigs to really put them through the test. There was things that I really loved about the Z5s, there was things I'm not so keen on, but over time, I also learned a variety of different things with the Z5 that I can pass on to you to optimize its use for real estate photography and possibly other genres as well. As there was a lot of discovery along the way, this is different than some of the other cameras in Nikon's lineup, not just DSLRs, but also some of the other Z cameras as well. So being able to take it out on over 100 different real estate photography gigs, I've got a lot of insight to give a full review here. This won't be just your typical, let's take it out of the box and see what it looks like. Just talk about the specs like everybody else does. This is real world stuff. This is how I make my money. And that's what this review is all about. For those who don't know me, my name is Nathan Cool. I'm a professional real estate photographer in Southern California, and I've also written best-selling books on real estate photography specifically, and I do this full-time. This is my income. So I'm very cautious about just buying new gear, but every year I have to buy new bodies because the high volume nature of my work requires me to buy new bodies because they do wear out over time. So the Z5 was kind of a no-brainer to start going toward or the Z6 or something else or just another mirrorless camera from the Canon or Sony line or some, some other line because that's the availability nowadays. So every year as I get new bodies, I have to think about going mirrorless. And there's a lot of other advantages to mirrorless, which I'll talk about in this review as well. But because of that, I was always still hesitant. This is a business. This is how I make my money. I can't just say that I wanna try it this, it seems like it's cool and that would be a cool to toy to play with. I have money riding on this. So there was in the past kind of held back a little bit on making the big leap until I was sure what what mirrorless camera brand and all that I'd be willing to go with. So there were things in the past with not just price, but there was lens availability. There was also workflow issues that would fall into this and just overall support. So those were the things that might have held me back in the past. There's things to work around that now. And also there's some benefits that can also speed things along to actually make me more money on my shoots. Those are the things I want to pass on to you with this review. But first and foremost, to be able to understand the things that I'm going to be looking at in this review, I want to share with you the setups that I use for doing the still photography for real estate. As you may know from my books and other videos, I use two camera bodies for my real estate photography stills work. One body is set up for interiors and the other is set up for exteriors. I continue to use for the interiors that Takina 16-28 f2.8 lens and when I'm doing exteriors I've got a body with a Nikkor 20mm f1.8 lens. Both cases use Nikon's FTZ2 adapter so I've got one of those on each one of these bodies. I found that to be a more cost effective setup than trying to use the newer Z glass. Those newer mirrorless lenses are just just a lot more expensive and really the results when using the older F-Glass are very impressive. They're actually better than using that F-Glass on the older DSLRs. After all, it's really the newer camera sensors that make the most difference with really no improvement at all going to the newer lenses like the Z-Line. I know eventually that some of these F-Glass uh, lenses may go away, but if you have some that you're still using now, there's no need to then invest in new lenses for this. The FTZ2 adapter has done a really great job. And so with that, using the Takina 16 to 28 Nikkor 20 millimeter, then I've got a great setup for both interior and exterior cameras. When it comes to cost, the Z5 with an FTZ2 adapter is only about 1500 bucks brand new. Add a Takina 16 to 28 on that and you've got $600 for that lens, so you'd have an all-in cost of about $2,100. That's right around the same cost as just the body for a Sony a7 III or just the body for a Z6 II and that's with out a lens. So the Z5 setup all in is $2,100. The exterior is just a little bit more because the Nikkor 20 millimeter lens runs about $800. Once again, that's the F-Glass. And you pair that with the Z5 with the FTZ2, that all-in price is $2,300. Still not bad for an all-in body lens, brand new for especially good quality. 
I love that the Z5 has dual SD card slots. The Z6 has only one slot for an XQD card, which is great for video, and that's what I use for video, or the Z6s, but it's not something I feel comfortable with taking the high volume of photos I need for my work. I use one card for backup at all times, so it's great to have those two SD cards. It's something that I recommend for any pro work, having those dual SD card slots with one backing up all the time. Now, the Z6 II does have two card slots, but only one is a SD, the other is XQD, and you just start mixing up how you're going to be transferring files and all that, you can, but I just love having dual SD card slots. That was one of the big pluses for me using the Z5 in my workflow. Using the Z5, I've found that I can do a faster workflow when I'm shooting interiors using the Flambient method because of the WYSIWYG feature, the what you see is what you get feature. And it really is for any mirrorless camera, as long as you have that center pin isolation for the flash trigger, like I've talked about in other videos. And by the way, if you're not familiar with that, I have a link to that in the description for this video, as well as some other pertinent information of this setup, uh, my books on the real estate photography and other information I think you'd find useful regarding this review. Having though that WYSIWYG view in the on the LCD, it allows me to quickly set ambient exposure for exposing to the right. Once I do, I can take an ambient shot, then see where ambient light starts to fall off by changing the shutter speed for taking the flash shot. And if I needed to also the window pull, and then of course getting a nice flambient finished image. By the way, the LCD screen I found on the Z5 tends to run a bit on the cool side. I do like that I can flip it out. And of course, as you turn it, it will change the color temperature and the color. So you wanna look straight on if you can. But I bear that in mind when I'm reviewing the shots and the EVF on it is okay, by the way, the electric viewfinder, but quite honestly, it's just good enough to really compose. You know, when I can't see the back screen, like when I'm outside, but it's really nothing to write home about, but it gets the job done, it's, it's fine. It's not something that would hold me back from getting the camera. Something I found with the Z5s is that the ISO expose is about one third stop brighter than the older DSLR bodies. Aperture and shutter speed check out the same as the older DSLRs, but as with other cameras, this is a common thing. ISO not really being an actual measured standard on digital cameras, it turns out brighter on the Z5, which is likely from the now more sensitive sensors in the Z lineup. I've seen something similar also on the Z6. But knowing this, for my exterior work, my go-to has changed from ISO 200 to ISO 160, just one third stop. I could change that ISO for interiors, but instead I just decided to optimize the depth of field. So I kept it at my standard ISO 320, and then I utilized that extra third stop in aperture going from my typical F7.1 to F8, giving me that little bit more depth of field. And by the way, if you're not familiar as much with ISO changing between cameras, you can Google that. It does. Fuji is a big one that knows. A lot of people will complain it's a little bit dark because of the ISO is different. But one way to test that is just to see the depth of field, how much stuff's in focus, doing a test on that. And then of course, shutter speed. That's just a matter of seeing then where your curtain starts to fall from your sync speed. And then that narrows it down to, yeah, this problem when you're exposing higher is coming from ISO. Active D-lighting is something that's different from what was implemented in the older DSLRs. I don't use it for interiors since it isn't recognized by Adobe products, but I do use active D-lighting for exteriors since I like to convert those RAWs to TIFFs using OEM software to get the best results for color. It's something I talk about in my recent book, Mastering Color and Photography, and if you have my exterior book, you know that I talk about it in there. So I found though with the active D-lighting that setting it to normal usually works very well well. Um, having it off just doesn't work quite as well. And high is just, just a little bit way too much. High plus auto I found does an awful job. It is just terrible compared to using the older DSLRs. And once again, this is something that I would only use for exteriors. And that's what I'm doing on the capture card here. This is uh, my exterior setting. I'll get to more of the bracketing and stuff here in a little bit. But the active D lighting, I do recommend using it in normal mode for exteriors. And of course, doing that three shot bracket and that I'll get to just shortly.
When it comes to picture profiles, I found that the picture profiles or picture control as Nikon calls it needs tweaking. It's something I do differently, whether it's interiors or exterior shots. So this is fairly common on many cameras. If you really want to punch up your images and get it the way that you really want it to look, it's easy enough to do. For interiors, uh, the picture profile information is thrown away out of the raw files, but you use a treatment profile. So it's something fairly Fairly easy to do and what I've done is over here this is for instance a flash shot of this bathroom you can see that I've selected a treatment profile as camera standard so a lot of times if you were just to bring something up here it would show Adobe color you might have seen this in some of my other uh, videos on treatment profiles but the, you would select that and you would go to maybe Adobe standard see if that's better but what I have found with the Z5 is to go down to browse and then you would go to the camera matching, this little section right here. And under camera matching, here are the various profiles that you could have. I found that camera standard works really well for this. So we close this out. If you can see that if I used camera standard compared to going back to Adobe Color, you can see there's a noticeable difference. So anyways, camera standard, is what I like to use for interior work. For exteriors, it's a little bit different though because as you may know, I like to use the OEM software, NX Studio in this case, to be able to convert the RAW files to TIFFs. Before getting to that though, it is important to note that the reds tend to be quite favored when it comes to the Nikon Z5. That's mostly how it's interpreted by Adobe when they're doing their demosaicing process. So I found that typically if I just reduce those reds just a little bit, that tends to get a more accurate tint in that auto white balance or even on the manual Kelvin, set, Kelvin settings if you're doing that. So just know that Adobe does tend to favor the reds. I've heard this also from users of the Z7 and I've seen it also in the Z6. Anyways, taking a look at the exteriors, that is just a little bit different and that's something you can do managing your picture control. Over here using NX Studio we can see some footage that I took of this particular building and we can see how the picture profile is different. You can see it's under picture control that's this little section up here and when you expand on that you can see some of the changes that I've made to that. So here, the typical uh, settings, you can see they would be up to about three. So if we put that to where it should be, it would be around the value of three for the mid-range sharpening. It would also have clarity up to about three and also saturation would be lower and hue would be up to about here. That's just not what I prefer. I didn't find this to be really good straight out of camera. So what I've done, let me just go back to where we were. And this, it's just a small, slight, little change but this is what I like to do. Now you could either just change this in X, NX Studio which is fine. I prefer to have these settings done in camera and that way they just follow into uh, the uh, NX Studio, the OEM software as they're just loaded up and I don't have to keep changing these values or save them as some preset value. It's already done in camera and that raw file carries that over then into the OEM software. To set this in camera, you go to the photo shooting menu and find manage picture control and hit OK. When you go into there, select the save and edit. You can hit the right arrow on your multi selector where the OK button's in the center. When you go in there, you can see this is the last one that I set and this is my custom one. It's assigned to C1 and I'll show you how that's done here in just a second. But what I like to do is go here. I went and just scrolled down a little bit and select a picture control you want to start with. I'll select the standard and then you hit the right arrow on your multi selector, not your OK button. And when I hit that, then you get all these various settings. Once again, this was done using that right arrow on your multi selector. Now you can see this is how standard is typically set up and I could scroll down here and make these various changes. So I could change this to let's say the settings that I liked. That was taking the mid range sharpening down to zero and then I took the clarity down to zero as well. As you recall I brought the saturation up one then I went down to hue and brought that down one as well. So those settings are ready.
Now what I can do is press the OK button. So that's the OK in the middle of the uh, multi-selector. So I press OK and now it wants me to assign it. And this is where then I can assign it to C2, C3, C4. You can see C1 was assigned for my original one. So I can press the right arrow and go into C2, which is unused, and then I can name it to whatever I want. Once I do that, and if I'm happy with this, I'm just going to hit, you can see the, um, the OK is actually the zoom in button, so I can hit OK. That saves that picture control. Now, if I wanted to set the picture control, either from the I menu or from here, I can go in here and I have various ones. I still have auto standard and all the others that they provide, but now I have different ones that I can select and I can either select to use my standard RE exterior or my standard OR2 O2 if that was something that was different. You can also do this from the I menu on the, uh, on the Z5 and the other Z cameras. And once again, this is something that doesn't necessarily have to be done uh, in camera. You can always change this in NX Studio. It only is going to apply to raw files that are brought into the OEM software anyways, but I found this was just a more efficient way to do it, and it also allows me to see then when I'm previewing the pictures on the back screen of the camera, what they really will look like when I bring them into the OEM software to convert them from RAWs to TIFFs. And once again, that's applied just to my exterior photos. So while the picture profile is tending to sharpen up these images quite a bit by default, I can say that it's not needed. That extra sharpening, the, the standard sharpening 3 was fine even for when you're doing the OEM software, but even if you were bringing it into Lightroom and a lot of that stuff would be thrown out, it is fairly sharp. This is a sharp camera. It's so sharp naturally, the Z5, it doesn't need to have a lot of sharpening added to it in post. I'll add some sharpening when importing those uh, interior shots straight into Lightroom, but those TIFFs coming straight out of NX Studio don't need any sharpening at all. I'm not going to get into the comparisons of sharpness. You can see for yourself, this, that's once again mostly just an academic exercise, but I can tell you from experience all the footage that I've shot, the Z5 is a very sharp camera. Focus is something that many reviewers will say is slower using F-Glass on the Z-Series cameras with the FTZ2 adapter, but I haven't found that to be the case. Focus is just as fast, if not faster in some cases, using the Z5 with, with the FTZ2 adapter when I'm comparing it to the DSLRs that I've used in the past. I also love how I can focus on anything in the frame. There are just focus points throughout the entire range of the sensor. So instead of those limited center points that you have on the older DSLRs, that's a great feature to have. That's just common with mirrorless cameras in general. By the way, I use the back button focus, which I also did with my older DSLR, so no major change there, moving to the Z5. Auto white balance when shooting interiors using flash is not as good as it was on the older Nikon DSLRs. I'm a little disappointed and it's not just the Z5, it's the Z series across the board. The Z6 shows the same problem, Z7 shows the same problem. On the Z5, I tend to use natural light auto, but on many jobs nowadays, I just use manual Kelvin settings. Something that I don't recommend if you're just starting out, but something you can get the hang of in no time. And by the way, I have links in the description of this video to other videos with my auto white balance recommendations, not just for the Z5, but other cameras and other brands of cameras. And also, if you want to try using Kelvin settings, I have a special video on that as well. Something that really grinds my gears with using the Z5 is the self-timer. The Z5's self-timer release mode reverts back to continuous once the camera is shut off, which is highly frustrating. I like to use the self-timer at two seconds for taking exterior shots with the camera on a tripod. It's easy enough. It then automatically takes a three-shot bracket, like I said, for one stop each. And I'll get to setting the bracket in here in just a second, some of the things I liked and didn't like about it. But 
when you do that on the self timer, you don't have to click off three separate shots. You just hit the shutter button once and boom, boom, boom. It just fires off the entire bracket. And that's a great feature to have instead of some of the shutter delay, you can do that, but then you have to take each one individually. So I just set it up on a tripod. Don't have to use a trigger. I'd use the two second timer, which is great. But the problem is, is that the, when you shut the power off, it goes back over into some other mode. One of the continuous modes or the single mode, something like that. So it's just reverts back every single time. So every time I power the camera on, I have to go in here to my release mode. Then I have to select my two second timer. And it does remember the last time that it was two seconds because it has obviously the other options, but I have to set that every single time. I just wish that it would remember every time I shut the power off that this is what it's supposed to have. You can also Google this. It's a common complaint from a lot of other photographers as well. Bracketing, uh, something that, like I mentioned, I like to do for exteriors. If you're doing HDR, you're gonna wanna be doing bracketing. I don't do HDR, so I rarely need it. It's just for my exterior camera, but it was just a pain. Now, I found a fast way to do this, and I'm gonna show you how I do it here by setting up some menu options. But it's something on the older DSLRs, it was just a simple button on the side of the camera, and you could use the thumb wheels while watching the top display. But with all the Z-series cameras, you have to dig through the menus, so here's what I do. One, go to the custom setting menu and select F controls. When you're in there, the first option, F1, is customize I menu. Select that. And then what you can do is you can select any of these options here. And you can see I sign, assigned what used to be Wi-Fi to bracketing. So now that I've got bracketing assigned to that, now if you wanted to change it, like let's say that you wanted to change this back to something else, there's all the various things that you can do. This would then show up in that, that spot in your I menu. So you could say you want that assigned to metering or you wanted to set it to active delighting, whatever it is that you wanted to do, but here what I selected is I selected it to bracketing, auto bracketing. So now if we go to the I menu, we can now see that that particular button is assigned to bracketing. And all you have to do then is select that bracket and select the type of bracketing that you want. I want the auto exposure. And then you can select the number of shots that you want. Now, if you wanna turn off bracketing, you would just turn that number of shots to zero. Here I have it set to three with the increment of one stop each. The battery life in the Z5 is something I've always been disappointed with in all the Z series cameras, but this is very typical of mirrorless cameras in general, in that there's just so much more going on that the batteries drain faster. So the battery life in the Z5 is shorter than most typical cameras, but I use the EN EL15C batteries. Those are the newest ones. They do last a lot longer and they can last for about a day of shooting, but really not much longer. I might be able to get a day and a half um, out of my type of work using the C batteries, but forget about using the 15B or 15A batteries. They just run out in no time. I mean, you can use them. They will be compatible with the camera. If you need a quick backup and you happen to have some Bs or As laying around, those. 15 A's or B's will work, but the 15 C batteries, they definitely will do better. I also recommend only getting the batteries through Nikon. A lot of those knockoffs, they're just not going to last. I've never had good luck with that. So anyways, use the EN EL 15 C's. They'll get you by. Keep always a couple backups though with you when you're on site. Sensor cleaning has become less often and much easier using the Z5s. The, the Z line really just in general because they're mirrorless cameras. There are far few moving parts compared to a DSLR since there's no mirror, so there's less dust that can be shaken loose from manufacturing parts. And there are fewer parts to gather dust on. I do like, as you know, to keep a lens married to each body. I don't like changing lenses. It's just too time consuming and it also just introduces dust. You're just asking for sensor or dust by changing lenses. So there is uh, an advantage though of having fewer moving parts, but with the sensor being so close to the opening of the body on mirrorless cameras, especially the Z body here, it's just 
begging for dust to come in. So always make sure you hold your camera upside down when you're changing lenses. Don't have it vertical or whatnot. You're just once again asking for trouble. So keeping a lens on the body though, it means I don't really have much of a problem with sensor cleaning. It's been very rare that I've had to go in. And when I do have to clean the sensor, I found that just lightly rolling a gel stick over the dust works well. I know a lot of other people use just a rocket blower and just knock the dust loose once again with the camera upside down. I'm always a little bit hesitant of that because I'm afraid I'm just gonna be blowing dust around the camera. Um, and so sometimes I'll use an eye loop and take a look at it as well. On the Nikon cameras, by the way, the IBIS is locked when you turn the camera off. So you're not gonna really worry about pushing down on the sensor, but it's still best not to press very hard like you would on older DSLRs. And that's why it's good to just do a light rolling motion over the, uh, the sensor with a gel stick. And once again, if you're uncomfortable cleaning your sensors, then you need to come up to speed on doing that. Just don't take my recommendation, use a gel stick, go in there and do something uh, to your camera. But for me, I found that to be the best solution. It's just so compared to using DSLRs, I'm cleaning my sensors just not nearly as often as I would in the older days. The Z5 does not have a top display, which is something I really miss. The Z6 has a decent top display, and the older Nikon DSLRs had a very detailed top display. This was a big thing when it came to pro work, having that top display in the DSLRs. This provided rapid access to camera settings, and I loved that I could just open up my camera case, look down, and see the battery life and SD card space in an instant. I now have to turn on each Z5 and look at the back screen LCD to get that simple information. I know it's a minor nit, and I understand why Nikon sacrificed this top display for more space, so I won't belabor the point, but I wanted to point that out. Sometimes it's little inconveniences like that that just can stand in your way of getting through your day faster than what you'd like. But this would never stop me from buying the Z5, which is why I have two of these now and will very likely order more of the Z5s next year. Now, when it comes to video, that's something that I don't do with the Z5 camera. I have Z6 bodies that I use for doing all of my real estate video work. In fact, this right now is being recorded on a Z6 that I leave dedicated on one of my stands in my office. But that's because the Z6 does a really good job with 4K video. It's uncropped, whereas the Z5, for some reason, has to crop it by a 1.7x factor. That could work, but when I'm doing real estate photography and I need to go really wide, I'm losing some of that. So I don't like to use the Z5 for video. I'm sure it would do a good enough job, but that's not why I bought the Z5s. I need to have dedicated cameras with my interior lens, another with my exterior lens, to be able to do that high volume work that I need to just shooting stills. I don't need to be changing lenses. I need bodies dedicated to doing just those two things. So that's important for me. Video, I use different cameras. Another thing that gets bad reviews with the Z5 is it doesn't have a high burst count. So it only does 4.5 frames per second in the high continuous mode, burst mode. And that for me is totally fine because for real estate photography, I'm using a shutter release. I'm not firing off 10, 20 photos at a time. I'm not doing sports photography. I'm not doing wildlife photography. So if you're doing those genres, yeah, it's not necessary to the camera to really think about, but 4.5 five frames per second still isn't bad if you needed to do that. That's still quite a quite a few frames per second to be able to use. But for me, that wasn't such a big deal. That was just not even part of my consideration for using them for real estate photography. Another thing that the Z5 doesn't get good marks for, which I found to be just an academic exercise, it doesn't even really matter in the real world results, is that it doesn't have the same sensor that the other Z camera bodies do like the six, the seven and all that. So it, it does have a, a lower end sensor, but it's really good. It's a better sensor that was in a lot of the Nikon DSLRs. Better sensor than the 610 than, and the 750. Same megapixel count. So for me, it was still a step above. Like I said, those are academic exercise things that really don't count in real world reviews. People read off the specs, they say this is what it is, it's supposed to do. But when you really put it to the test, I found no difference between using the photos that come out of the Z5 and photos coming out of the Z6. 
and you'll hear a lot of stuff out there. You'll read it. It'll say the Z5, the entry level camera. Well, that's what they used to call the D610. That's what they called the D600. That's what they called the D750. And sometimes they'd call it a prosumer camera, but entry level, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, sure, you could be an entry level person, use one of those cameras, but it works for pro work. And I know guys that are using this and also gals too for wedding photography. It works very well. So this isn't some entry level cheapo camera. Nikon makes really good cameras, even when Nikon was making the crop sensor cameras, which doesn't have as many nowadays, but those are still really well made cameras. This is a full frame camera. It gets really good high end results. I've been shooting luxury homes with it, so I would consider it, yes, a pro camera. Entry level, I don't know why they would ever call it that. I think that's more of a marketing ploy so that you'll, oh, I'm a pro. I need to buy the Z7. I need to spend two or three times the amount that what they're selling this for. And because of that too, the Z5 doesn't get all the attention. It doesn't get publicized as much. In fact, you won't find it on DxO Mark uh, because it's the, you know it's felt like, oh, it's not really a pro camera, but it is. So that's why I wanted to really put it through the test. I found that a lot of times marketing hype doesn't match real world professional work. And so doing real work and needing to make an income off this and not wanting to just break the bank with the latest, greatest toys and following the latest shiny baubles, I wanted to really put this through the test. I have. I am extremely happy with the Z5. I've learned how to not just utilize it to my advantage with overcoming some of its shortcomings, but how to optimize it to make my work faster and also better. And now the Z5 is one of my recommendations for real estate photography.